Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It's so, so nice to be gathered here together in the sanctuary at Westchester Reform Temple for our Friday night Kabbalat Shabbat evening service. I'm Rabbi Daniel Reeser. This is Cantor Amanda Kleinman. We're joined in the leadership of this evening's service by Pete Malinverney, our pianist and conductor, as well as by Idan Sontaus on woodwinds and Jerome Morris on percussion, and also by the president of the synagogue's board of trustees by Warren Haber. It's especially nice this evening on the first Shabbat where masking is optional here in our sanctuary to see the faces of those congregants who feel ready to be unmasked in public. For those who don't yet feel ready, that's okay. We'll all make that decision in our own time. But it's really energizing for me as a prayer leader and I imagine for others on the Bema to be able to see your faces. You may have been in a synagogue before that above the ark has the phrase written, da lifne mi ata omed, meaning know before whom you stand. It's supposed to be a reminder for the people who come to the synagogue to pray, to know that it's in fact in front of our creator, the eternal God, that we stand when we come together in a moment of prayer. And I've heard it said before that that phrase shouldn't just be written over the ark for the congregation, but also for the people who are leading from the bima, it should be written on the back wall of the sanctuary in order to help us remember and to know whom it is before whom we stand, in order to know and to feel the hearts of the congregation, to feel ourselves in relationship with one another. It's wonderful this evening to know whom it is before whom we stand. To help us welcome Shabbat, too many whoms in that sentence. Tried not to end with a preposition, that's what happens. <laughs> To help us welcome Shabbat, we'd invite the president of our board of trustees, Warren Haber, to kindle these Sabbath candles. Baruch Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshano b'mitzvotav, v'tivanu v'hadlik ne'er shel shabbat. Amen. Thank you, Warren. We will continue together in our prayer books on page 138 with L'cha Dodi.
page 146. Avato lam beit Yisrael amcha ahavta Torah umitzvot chukim umishpatim otanu limadata. We praise you, our eternal God, for giving us the gift of your Torah, the wisdom of our ancestors, the traditions that have been passed down to us from generation to generation. Our ancestors were no less sophisticated than us in their hearts, only in their technology. They sought questions and answers, the same ones that we seek after, and passed wisdom down from the times of the Torah through all the generations and unto our own. We give thanks for the wisdom of the sages, for the poets of Israel, for the thinkers and the scholars who have helped us to inherit such a rich tradition, full of literature, full of guidance, full of ideas, full of creativity. God, we feel your love in the wisdom of our people. And so we say, Baruch Atah Adonai Ohev Amo Yisrael. Praise to you, our eternal God, who shows love for your people Israel through the wisdom of our tradition. Amen.
We may be seated. They ahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol levavcha ubechol nafshecha Ubechol meodecha Vehayu hadvarim ha'ele Asher anuchi metzavecha Hayom al levavecha Veshinatam levanecha Vidibarta baham, Beshiv techa bebe techa, Uvlech techa baderech, Uvshoch becha uvkumecha, Ukshartam leot ayadecha, Vehayulet otafot bene necha, Uchtav tam, Amizuzot be techa, Uvisharecha. Leman tiskeru basitem et komit votai vitem kedoshim lelohechem ani Adonai elohechem asher hosei tiachem meeretz mitzrayim liot lachem lelohim ani Adonai elohechem. We continue with our people's Song of Freedom on page 158, Micha Mocha.
We invite you now to take a few moments for private reflection. You might find words of inspiration in our prayer book or find the words in your heart. You can spend this time either standing or sitting.
Shabbat Shalom. My great-grandfather, Alexander Reeser, of blessed memory, after whom my father is named, was born in 1881 in the city of Lviv in western Ukraine. According to an exhaustive family record, which traces our lineage all the way back to the 1700s, Alexander's parents and grandparents were merchants in the lumber business. They traded and exported all across the Pale of Settlement wood that had been chopped down in the dense oak forests of western Ukraine. Over the past few weeks and months, as the tension in Ukraine has escalated into all-out war, my great-grandpa Alex has often been on my mind. Even though I never knew him, and even though I've never been there, I feel, on some deep level that I cannot fully explain, a connection to Ukraine, and specifically to the city of Lviv. There are, of course, many reasons to care about the war in Ukraine. Like so many others, I am appalled by Russia's blatant disregard for the sovereignty of a neighboring nation. This unprovoked war represents not only a threat to Ukraine, not only a threat to the stability of Europe, not only a threat to NATO, but also a threat to democracy and the rule of law. Like so many others, I fear for the life of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who has shown incredible leadership and bravery over these past weeks, and also fear for the lives of the Ukrainian fighters whose resistance against the better-resourced Russian military has, so far, proven stronger than expected. Like so many others, my heart breaks for the humanitarian crisis that has been unleashed, with thousands, excuse me rather, with hundreds of innocent civilians killed, and with estimates as of yesterday evening of more than a million people who have fled to neighboring countries and a million more who are internally displaced, taking shelter in the subway stations in order to avoid the bombardment of missiles. I urge the congregation to help provide humanitarian relief by donating toiletries, diapers, and first aid kits, which will be distributed through the Afia Foundation and are being collected in bins outside the main doors to Westchester Reform Temple. You can make those donations through this coming Wednesday. But for us as Jews, our reasons for concern about Ukraine are not only about geopolitics, are not only about the humanitarian crisis, but also this is about our heritage. Even for those of us who do not trace our family's lineage there, as I do with my great-grandpa Alex, Ukraine matters deeply to the Jewish people. On Wednesday, President Zelensky, who is himself proudly Jewish, recorded a video message addressed to the Jewish people of the world. In it, he reminded us that Russia's attempt to erase Ukrainian history also, in part, erases Jewish history. Since the war began, missiles have fallen on the town of Uman, where the Hasidic master Rebbe Nachman of Breslov is buried, and which has become an annual pilgrimage site for hundreds of thousands of Jews who come to pray at the tomb of the revered rabbi. Missiles have also damaged the Babayar Memorial Center in Kiev, a memorial site dedicated to the massacre that was perpetrated there during the Holocaust, in which over the course of just two days, 33,000 Ukrainian Jews were dragged from their homes, shot dead, and thrown into a mass grave. All across Ukraine, there are numberless places that matter to the Jewish people. Whether it's the pilgrimage site of Uman, the ravine of Baba Yar, the vibrant synagogues and community centers that serve the 150,000 Jews living in Ukraine today, or the dense oak forests of Lviv, where 150 years ago, my great-grandfather Alex and his family earned their living. To be sure, Jewish history in Ukraine has been decidedly stormy, darkened by the Khmelnytsky massacre in the 1650s, 
followed by centuries of czarist restrictions about where Jews could and could not live and what professions they could and could not enter. Forced military conscription, including sometimes on children. Countless pogroms committed by our neighbors. Accusations of blood libel, the medieval myth that Jews use Christian blood in order to make matzah charged against us even as late as the 20th century. The mass shootings of the Holocaust of which Baba Yar is just the most well-known example, carried out by Germans, but also sometimes assisted by local Ukrainians. The repressions of the Soviet era, the list of Jewish tragedies in Ukraine goes on and on and on. And yet, despite these many tragedies, Jewish history in Ukraine is also incredibly rich. The number of Jewish luminaries who were born or lived in what is now Ukraine is staggering. The Baal Shem Tov, Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, Sholem Aleichem, Shai Agnon, Achad Ha'am, Chaim Nachman Bialik, Golda Meir, Natan Sharansky, to name just the most familiar few. The Jews of Ukraine were impressively culturally productive. Together, they pioneered three major innovations in modern Jewish life, without which the Jewish world as we know it today would likely be unrecognizable. The Hasidic revolution, the flowering of Yiddish literature, and the Zionist movement. We might ask, what was it about the Jewish experience in Ukraine that despite our people's stormy history there, Nevertheless, we were able to be so culturally productive. Why is it that these three major innovations, Hasidism, Yiddish literature, and Zionism, were all born in Ukraine? To help us answer this question, we need a crash course in modern Jewish history. It's a story that can be told in two contrasting parts the Jewish experience in Western Europe, places like France, Germany, and Austria, and the Jewish experience in Eastern Europe, places like Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine. Let's start with Western Europe. For the Jews of Western Europe, the modern era begins with the French Revolution and its battle cry of liberté, égalité, fraternité, or liberty, equality, and brotherhood the centuries of inequality between nobility and peasants gave way to the ideals of the Enlightenment, the rights of citizenship, equal protection under the law, democracy. And as these ideals spread across Western Europe, the walls of the Jewish ghettos gradually came down. Our ancestors were emancipated and granted equal citizenship under the law. But in exchange for their citizenship, the Jews of Western Europe were expected to participate in the majority culture of the nation. They needed to speak French, look French, act French. Gone were the days in which one's primary group association was with the Jewish community. Identifying as French or German or Austrian had to come first. The Jews of Western Europe adapted accordingly. It was there that our own reform movement was born, out of a desire to make our worship services look and feel more like the Protestant services of our German neighbors, with prayers in the vernacular, instrumental organ music, and mixed seating for men and women. It was there that modern Jewish philosophy flourished, with thinkers such as Moses Mendelssohn and Martin Buber, mirroring the esteemed German intellectual tradition of Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche. For the Jews in Western Europe, emancipation created for them the need to fit in with their neighbors. All of these developments stand in sharp contrast to the experience of the Jews in Eastern Europe. For them, the modern era begins not with the French Revolution and emancipation. Rather, for the Jews of Eastern Europe, modernity begins with a historical moment that has resonances to today. It begins with the Russian annexation of Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine. 
as the Russian Empire expanded westward, it newly found itself in control over many ethnic minorities, including Poles, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, and Jews. And in an effort to organize this jumble of groups, the empire relied on the medieval institution of social estates, categorizing people into groups, each with its own set of differing rights and responsibilities. Unlike the Jews in the West, who, after being emancipated, had to minimize their Jewish group identity, the Jews in the East were moved in exactly the opposite direction and were now politically defined specifically as a group. And it is this difference between West and East, this sense of collective Jewish identity, that caused the Jews of Ukraine to be so impressively culturally productive. Although their collective identity was forced upon them as a political status, it nevertheless led to the three major innovations that we've mentioned, the Hasidic revolution, the flowering of Yiddish literature, and the Zionist movement. Let us consider each of them briefly in order. First, the Hasidic revolution. In the 1700s, Jewish life in Eastern Europe was in disarray. Under the burden of heavy taxes, the community didn't have enough money to properly fund the yeshivas where rabbis would train and study. As a result, both the scholarship and the leadership abilities of the rabbis began to suffer, and the community began to grow disillusioned with them. And it was into this leadership crisis that the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, was born. He developed revolutionary ideas about Jewish life. To him, it didn't matter that the yeshivas were poor and that the community was weak. He taught instead that prayer is more important than study, that the heart is more important than the mind, that joyful piety is more important than Talmudic erudition, that the simple Jewish commoner can be as close to God as the greatest learned sage. Unlike the religious reformers of Western Europe, who had worked to make Judaism more closely resemble their Christian neighbors, the Baal Shem Tov in Ukraine worked to make Judaism more closely resemble the life of the everyday Jew. Hasidism attracted followers by the millions. Second, the flowering of Yiddish literature. While the emancipated Jews in the West were learning to speak French and German, the unemancipated Jews in the East had no choice other than to more fully embrace their mother tongue, the Mamalushan, Yiddish. They created a rich literary culture, teeming with Yiddish novels, short stories, poems, essays, newspapers, journals, stage plays, and songs with the Ukrainian port city of Odessa as its vibrant, beating heart. Unlike the Jewish writers in the West, who composed serious cerebral books of modern Jewish philosophy, the Yiddish writers in the East composed stories about the lives of everyday Jews, about Tevye, the milkman, and his daughters, written by the most famous Ukrainian Jew, Sholem Aleichem or about an incident of getting lost on the way to the train station, or a story about falling asleep in shul and accidentally sleeping through the entirety of Rosh Hashanah. These are stories about the people in the language of the people. Third, the Zionist movement. We tend to think of Theodor Herzl, who was from Western Europe, as the founder of the Zionist movement. But in fact, the vast majority of Zionist leaders and their followers came from Eastern Europe, and many of them came from Ukraine. Two of these Ukrainian Zionists were Leon Pinsker, who predated Herzl by 15 years, and to whom Herzl, Herzl's ideology is deeply indebted, and also the Ukrainian Zionist Achad Ha'am. Both Pinsker and Achad Ha'am observed that emancipation of Jews in the West had come with some negative side effects. Pinsker pointed out 
that even after they had been emancipated, Western Jews continued to face discrimination. True, they had been made citizens, but they were second-class citizens at best. What's more, the Jews had very little power over their own emancipation. They had to passively wait until the state decided that it was ready to emancipate them, and they might be waiting for a very long time. In his influential pamphlet called Auto Emancipation, Pinsker called upon the Jews of Eastern Europe to stop passively waiting, to take matters into their own hands, and to establish a Jewish national movement. Achad Ha'am, for his part, also saw the negative side effects of emancipation, but from a different angle. He pointed out that emancipation also led to assimilation. As an antidote to this problem, Achad Ha'am created the idea of cultural Zionism, the notion that the Jews should reestablish a Hebrew civilization in the land of Israel, from which a rich Jewish culture and a thick sense of Jewish pride would flow outwards to all the lands of the diaspora. All three of these innovations, Hasidism, Yiddish literature, and Zionism, were pioneered in Ukraine. All three of them reflect the political status of the Jews of Eastern Europe, who, unlike their Western counterparts, were not emancipated until the 20th century. On account of this, all three innovations are expressions of Jewish collective identity. The feeling that to be Jewish is, first and foremost, to be a part of a group. Hasidism as the religion of the people. Yiddish literature as the language and stories of the people. And Zionism as the national movement of the people. This is why Ukrainian Jews were so impressively culturally productive. They understood themselves as belonging to a people, part of a sprawling, extended family. In every nuclear family, in yours as well as in mine, there are certain places that each of us holds dear. The town in which we were raised, the beaches on which we have vacationed, the park where we proposed to our spouse, the cemetery where our parent is buried. These places are full of memories. These places have shaped who we are. Even though I have never been there, and even though I never met him, the dense oak forests of western Ukraine in which my great-grandfather Alex's family earned their living, shaped my family's story. The place will always be a part of us, and we will always be a part of it. And what is true for nuclear families is also true for the sprawling, extended family that is the Jewish people. Even for those of us who do not trace our lineage to Ukraine, still, it is a place that we cherish. It is a place that shaped the Jewish story. It is a place that produced our culture. We Jews will forever care about Ukraine, for there we have known that to be Jewish is to be part of a family. Shabbat Shalom. beloved Yiddish melody about the Ukrainian town of Belts. Tell me, old man, tell me quickly, because I want to know everything now. How does the little house look that once sparkled? Does the little tree I planted still bloom? The little house is old, overgrown with grass. The old roof is crumbling. The windows are without glass. The attic is crooked, the walls bent you'd never recognize it. Bells, my little town, bells, my little home where I spent my childhood years. Bells, my little town, bells, in the poor little house where I laughed with all the children. Every Shabbos I'd run to read by the river. Bells, my little town, bells, my little home where I had so many. 
beautiful dreams. hearts turn now to people who are in need of prayers of healing. And if there's someone you're carrying with you in your heart this evening, someone who would feel good to know that you had been thinking of them tonight and you'd like to share their name with the rest of us, I invite you to rise in your place and say their name aloud at this time. In addition to these names, we as a Westchester Reformed Temple community are praying for healing for Jennifer Leventhal, Sarah Horan, Linda Feldman, Reuven Avraham ben Mordechai Va'ada, Zalman Pesach, Donna Pertula, Grace Neidish, Avraham Feivel ben Michal, Herschel ben Sara, Avraham ben Miriam, Yitzchak Halevi ben Sholem, Elizabeth Harz, Barbara Feldman, Tony and Gina Delapa, Matthew Atwood, Ruth Weinfeld, Linda Byron Glucksman, Gloria Byron, Anthony and Elizabeth Danker, Mordechai Ben Yaakov, Deborah Kapnick, Nicole Schusi, Neil Glasgow, Leah Greenspan, Andrea Reiner, Masha Batsora, Aviva Tsila Bat Esther Bela, Jeffrey Millman, Andre Goldstein, Ken Master, Chava Batsara, Eliyahu Chaim Ben Fredel, Sheila Fried, Malka Tsipora Bas Rachel, Tamar Bat Malka, Heschel, Mayer, Ben Davida Hanna, and other names that we carry with us privately in our hearts. Our Misha Beirach prayer for healing can be found in our Sidurim on page 371. Bye. 
Our concluding prayers begin on page 586. Would the congregation please rise? Alleinu le shabeach la don hakol, la teit gedul aliot ser breishit, shelo asanu kegoye haratso, velo osamanu kemish bechot adama, shelo sam chalkeinu kahem, begor aleinu kechol hamonam, banachnu korim, umishachavim umodim, Lifne melech malche hamlachim, akadosh baruchu. This morning, there was a funeral service here in the sanctuary. And after the funeral came to an end and the family was greeting guests in the social hall, I remarked to the daughter of the deceased that I couldn't stay long because the clergy team was going to perform a conversion of someone who was joining the Jewish fold. And she looked at me and she said, that's wonderful. We lost one and now we've gained one. And that's exactly what the power is of being a part of a synagogue community, is that it helps us to locate the joys and the sorrows of our lives within the joys and sorrows of a community, to help us see that when we've had a loss, someone sitting right next to us may have had a joy, a simcha, and help us to feel and to truly see that life is indeed a cycle, that for every departure there is an arrival. And so as we prepare to turn our hearts to people who have departed this earth, I'd invite mourners in our congregation to rise and be acknowledged in the following order so that we can all behold the reality of departures. If you are currently in the period known as Ani Nut, where a loved one has died but has not yet been laid to rest, would you please rise and be acknowledged? If you're within the first seven days of mourning your loved one, would you please rise? If you're within the first 30 days of mourning, would you now rise? And if you're in the first year of mourning, would you please rise? If this Shabbat marks the yard site, the anniversary of your loved one's death, would you please rise? I'd ask the community to rise together as one in support of the mourners among us as we remember. We remember first those most recently taken from us in the period of Ani Newt, Jessia Mag Magidman, grandmother of Dahlia Lenskis. And in the first 30 days of mourning, we remember Walter P. Stern, husband of Betsy Stern, father of Sarah May Stern, William Stern, and David Stern. Stephen Blackman, brother of Michael Blackman, Char Charles Joseph Satuloff, husband of Elaine Satuloff, father of Amy Lemley and Nancy Abraham, and grandfather of John Lemley, Cliff Lemley, Tracy Levy, and Edie Abraham. Blanche Silver, mother of Pam Rubin and Cheryl Bernstein. Noel Flagg, senior, father of Noel Flagg. Phyllis Lubin, mother of Brad Lubin. Lillian Marlene Quinn, mother of Deb Kolodner. Carrie Barkus, daughter of Hope Barkus and Alan Barkus. And on their yard site and on the anniversary of their death, we remember Alan Albert, Renee Arisu, Ellie Baltman, Shirley Beck, Barbara Bell, Ellen Berger, Ruth Berger, Eleanor Levin, Esther Berkeley, Raymond Bone, Marion Jean Birch, Norman Braun, Robin Brown, Jason Cammy, Ian Cascade, Marvin Chamlin, Phoebe Chasen, Zvi Shashinsky, Saul Davis, Jane DeSocio, Jonah Dreskin, Geraldine Ezrin, Michael Fish, Julia Forsheimer, Fred Friendly, Henrietta Weiss, Sylvia Glasner, Rose Gluck, Minda Goroff, Gerald Mark Granitor, Adrian Gray, Irving Grobstein, Charles Hefter, Martin Herbert, 
Amanda Kanowitz, Berta Lenskis, Mia Lerner, Murray Levine, Samuel B. Mandel, Ann Messenger, David Messenger, Harold Pankin, Becky Meyerson, Mildred Reese, Alice Paulin, Evelyn Richman, Iris Rogers, Marion Rosenstadt, Morton Ross, Leon Rothberg, Alan Scheffler, Kathy Schneider, Edith Siegel, Richard Selznick, John Stillman, Helen Ullman, Gladys Wallace, Mary Katz Weinstein, Sidney Weissenberg, Nan Zankel, and other names that we carry with us in our hearts. If there are any names to add to our commemoration which have not yet been said aloud or that I've inadvertently mispronounced, I invite you to say them now. The words of the Mourner's Kaddish can be found on page 598. We say together, Yit Gadal v'yit Kadash Shamei Rabbah, b'alma divrach yirutei v'yamlich malchutei, b'chayechon u'v'yomechon u'v'chayei d'chol b'yit Yisrael, b'agala u'v'yizman kariv v'imru amen. Yehei Shamei Rabbah m'varach le'olam u'lamei amaya, Yit Barach, the Yishtabach, the Yit Paar, the Yit Ramam, the Yit Nase, the Yit Hadar, the Yit Ale, the Yit Halal, Shemed Kucha, Brehu, Le Ela, Min Kol, Birchata, the Shirata, Tush Bechata, the Nechemata, the Amiran, the Alma, the Imru, Amen, Yehe, Shlama Raba, Min Shemaya, the Chaim, Alenu, the Alko Israel, the Imru, Amen, Ose Shalom, Bim Ramav, Hu Ya Ase Shalom. Alenu ve al kol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. It's now my honor to invite forward Warren Haber, board president, to offer some announcements. Uh, good evening. I'd like to uh, thank our clergy and musicians for leading our wonderful service this evening. A few quick announcements. We have a tour study tomorrow at 9 a.m. via Zoom and Sharon Shabbat at 9. Uh, we also have a few um, sessions this week, including Thursday with Rabbi Levy, Unpacking the Prayer Book. And on Thursday, March 10th at 7.30, we have via Zoom, Systemic cause, Causes of Black People's Underrepresentation in Scarsdale. Um, indeed, we've got a big month with our pre-Purim Palooza coming up, uh, the JLL Purim, on Sunday, March 13th at 9 a.m., the online family Purim service, and from 10.30 to 1, there's a community Purim drive through with a huge carnival in our parking lot here, so come in costume and decorate your car, come for games, music, and more. Um, we also have the actual Purim uh, holiday, the, the whole Megillah, on uh, Wednesday, March 16th from 7 to 8, and there's a congregational-wide Purim celebration, so come one, come all, join us and have fun for this festive outdoor celebration. Uh, I'd like to thank our greeter this evening, Donna Sherry, um, and uh, wish a very happy and healthy mitzvah to uh, the Madison and uh, Riley Madison and family, Noah Dembitzer and family, as well as Alexis Perry and family. Shabbat shalom. We'll conclude our time together with song, a prayer for peace, Ose Shalom. Would the congregation please rise?
Shabbat Shalom. Check, check, check. Check, check.
ಏನಿದೆಯಾ ಸರ್